so good evening to all uh i'm very very happy that uh, you have uh, actually joined my uh live request so you have joined our family so basically i am vishnu uh, i finished my doctor of pharmacy course then i worked as an assistant professor and i also worked as a clinical pharmacist dealing with antimicrobial stewardship so uh, around i think uh, one week before it was also on a sunday one or two weeks before uh, i had actually posted some questions for you like uh, what are the topics that you want me to make videos on or something like that so it was very surprising i got approximately 640 topics from all of you to talk about or make topics on so definitely i am working on that it is going to be a slow process because so many topics i have got but please be assured that uh, i will not disappoint you okay and uh, so let's come to some very common questions that i received in this few days from many of you like many of you are from pharmacy background many of you are from mbbs background many of you are from dental background many of you are from ayurveda and many other backgrounds so let's come to the some of the common questions first question how to remember pharmacology easily and uh, many of you have asked this question as well as in uh, what is my concept of smart learning like if you look into my instagram page i have always whenever i mention any quote i write dr vishnu smart learning tips so what do i mean by smart learning see basically smart learning is an extension of working hard because see all of us work hard you crack your exams maybe you get distinction you are the rank holder and all these things but at the end of the day after few months when you revise the same topic you remember nothing so that is because you are working hard and you are not working smart how to work smart so there are three ways as in you can work smart regardless of whatever topic you are attending whether it is pharmacology whether it is therapeutics whether it is toxicology whether it is any branch of medicine if you want to work smart there are three ways and these three ways are those ways that i experimented in my study life and my career life and to a great extent i found success in that so i'm sharing it with you um first method is always make your own notes now many people will ask this question that making notes is actually a very tedious job because uh, you it's better to read directly from the book rather than making your own notes but what happens is that when you are reading directly from the book please remember most of the books they are written in very complex language and when you try to read directly from the book you are trying you are forcing your brain to absorb those complex languages and that is the reason why most of us forget a lot of things so when you make your own notes the benefit is that your memory power improves your handwriting improves and the same note when you are presenting to somebody else they also understand it very easily because you understood it and you made your own notes like in this past 8 to 9 years i have made around 450 notes if you want a sample of that you can just inbox me or you can whatsapp me i'll just share you and because of this notes that i have made on my own although it took a lot of time i remember a lot of things today and i can correlate a lot of things today like i share in my reels and youtube videos and posts so this is my first uh, strategy as in how you can you know uh, make your learning smart second thing please keep the habit of discussing with someone now when i started this youtube channel uh, uh many people actually ask me this question as in uh, like many people they uh, bring a lot of clinical cases or they discuss a lot of cases with me and uh, they find their observations they share with me or with regards to medication whatever it is so what happens is that when you discuss you tend to remember things better so basically when i used to do combined study with my friend during exams i used to remember things better rather than simply sitting at a table and studying it on my own 
because when you uh, discuss what happens they share their information you share your information and there is a quote in english which says knowledge shared is knowledge doubled so i believe that if you have a combined study with someone who is your well wisher and uh, if you discuss things or your daily observations with someone that will also be very good as a part of smart learning and memory and the third option this is the most important option that is please read good books many people ask me this question which is a good book for pharmacology and if you simply type pharmacology in amazon if you simply type pharmacology maybe in telegram or if you simply type pharmacology on google you will find a lot of books you will find the names of a lot of books i am not here to uh, market any particular book but i will definitely suggest you some books which from my personal experience has literally literally revolutionized my way of learning for example if you don't know about a particular topic like uh, if it is the autonomic nervous system and you literally don't know anything about it the best book to start with in my opinion is tara v shanback you can it is a very simple book it's a medium size book uh, if you don't know anything about that chapter literally nothing about that chapter you can start with tara v shanback there is another book known as padmaja uday kumar that is also an equally good book the benefit of those books is that when they write things they write in flow charts and they write in very very simple points so what happens is that you tend to remember things better now comes the question of kd tripathi many people ask me this question in my personal experience kd tripathi is something that i will not directly suggest if you are struggling with pharmacology if you are an expert in pharmacology if you believe that you have a good hold agar aapka pakad pharmacology mein bahut acha hai maybe kd tripathi is something that i will suggest to you or even higher books are there like goodman and gilman is there uh, cadsung is there but for a person who is struggling with pharmacology i will never suggest kd tripathi and i'll tell you the reason why having knowledge is another thing and how you present that knowledge is another thing kd tripathi undoubtedly is amazingly knowledgeable in fact every 4 years they come with a new updation and if you look at their book it is filled with knowledge but the way the knowledge is presented is not good because most of the messages that i get from people is a very simple question how to study pharmacology and i will never be getting this question and i will never have this question in my mind if the books that we were reading were simple so it means that you are trying to digest a complex carbohydrate which is not easy kd tripathi is an amazing book if you want to study classifications if you look at every chapter if you look at the classifications written it is amazing very few books can actually compete with it but if you look at all the other aspects my personal experience tells me because i usually say perspectives my personal experience tells me that it is not a very good option so i will also suggest another book if you are preparing for competitive exams and if you want to you know make your learning much more easy so as i already said tara v shanback and padmaja uday kumar is there other than that there is one book known as lipin cots pharmacology reviews lipin cots pharmacology reviews its pdf is available if you go on amazon you will get the recent edition i think 2022 or 23 indian um edition book is also available in fact i have the hard copy of it i just bought it few months back if you look at that book the benefit is the ideas are given in pictures like for example if a particular medicine like uh, anticholinergics they cause constipation they cause fever because they block the sweat glands they cause dry mouth and all this kind of things or they cause blurred vision in lipin cot they will be showing the same idea in pictures so what happens is that when you are seeing pictures or when you are seeing videos it stays in your memory much more than simple boring words and the way things are written in lipin cot is literally very easy to understand it's written in flow charts it's written in animations its pdf is available but i think the pdf that i have is 2019 edition which is like 4 years back if you want that pdf i'll 
whatsapp it to you but uh, i'll suggest you to get a hard copy if you can this is a book which is literally very amazing and once you get a good base on pharmacology then if you want you can try higher books like kd tripathi if you want you can try there is another book called basic and clinical pharmacology by katzen k a t z u n g basic and clinical pharmacology by katzen you can start you can try that also and definitely goodman and gilman is the last option means <laughs> it is almost like the bible of uh, pharmacology it's it's too 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 heavy so this is one question that i receive from many people as in which is the best book to study pharmacology there is no current i cannot say that this is the best but there are some books which can make your learning very simple because at the end of the day if you don't learn it in simple words if you don't understand the concept you can never apply or you can never correlate or think in your clinical practice so that's my opinion and uh, another way to study and uh, one more question that i get from people is uh, how to study pharmacology see basically uh, i was just uh, this is some interesting information for you i don't know whether you know it since uh, so many people have come live uh, i think that i should gift you with some amazing knowledge right so i was just uh, you know i just uh, i was just doing some work and then i came across an article i will share that link with you in your inbox it's like i think it's a systematic review and meta analysis it is an article that says that proton pump inhibitors can increase the risk of memory loss or dementia once again proton pump inhibitors can increase the risk of dementia or memory loss now i'll tell you how so i that see this is something that i read for the first time i never knew this thing happens so when i looked at the mechanism when i looked at how it occurs then they showed three mechanisms okay there are three reasons if you know about alzheimer's disease and if you know about the pathogenesis of alzheimer's disease which usually happens in the elderly there is something called beta amyloid tissues and this beta amyloid tissue actually damages your neuron and that is actually one important uh factor for alzheimer's disease beta amyloid tissue proton pump inhibitors have been shown to cross the blood brain barrier because if they have to show any effect in the cns that means they have to cross the blood brain barrier proton pump inhibitors have been shown to cross the blood brain barrier and increase the activity of beta amyloid tissues so definitely that can increase the risk of dementia second mechanism proton pump inhibitors by reducing gastric acid because you know its mechanism right what do they do proton pump inhibitors they go inside your body they block the proton pump so when the proton pump is blocked hydrogen ion is not produced and when hydrogen ion is not produced hydrochloric acid is not produced this hydrochloric acid is actually very important for the absorption of vitamin b12 in your intestine so proton pump inhibitor inhibitor what they do is they interfere with the reabsorption of vitamin b12 from the small intestine so what happens vitamin b12 gets eliminated if you look at the functions of vitamin b12 in our body first function it is very important for your nerves second function it is actually good for your hair growth other than biotin and third function it is actually important for good memory so proton pump inhibitors if you are using in the long term by reducing vitamin b12 number 1 they can precipitate sorry so they can actually cause dementia and the third reason why ppis can cause dementia in fact if you want the detailed version of this article just inbox me i'll send you the link okay so you can download it and check it out and the third mechanism is when proton pump inhibitors block gastric acid you know what is the function of acid in the body number 1 is for digestion and number 2 is whenever you take any food whenever you consume any food especially if it is outside food there are so much of bacteria because you know whenever you buy food from outside it's not that much hygienic 
but it doesn't mean that everybody will start getting food poisoning everybody will get diarrhea or something because there is something called hydrochloric acid which actually kills most of the pathogenic bacteria that goes inside so when you are taking proton pump inhibitors on the for a long time it reduces hydrochloric acid production so what happens unhealthy bacteria increases and healthy bacteria gets reduced okay so when unhealthy bacteria increases they actually start increasing the absorption of vitamin b12 because this unhealthy bacteria also start competing for absorbing this vitamin b12 so like that also vitamin b12 gets reduced in our body which can lead to dementia now this is something that i studied for the first time and this thing i studied maybe one hour before so this is exactly how you need to study pharmacology so if you ask me how to study pharmacology always target the pharmacological actions of a medicine pharmacological action of a medicine is classified into two number 1 mechanism of action number 2 mechanism of side effect mechanism of action means what is the beneficial effect of the drug in the body for example proton pump inhibitor goes into your body blocks the proton pump hydrochloric acid is not produced which is good for peptic ulcer disease gastritis gastroesophageal reflux disease etc so this is the mechanism of action what is the mechanism of side effect proton pump inhibitor goes into your body reduces calcium level causes hypocalcemia proton pump inhibitor goes into your body reduces magnesium level so it causes hypomagnesemia proton pump inhibitor goes into your body reduces acid production so unhealthy bacteria increases that increases the risk of diarrhea in fact you may have heard that proton pump inhibitors can also increase the risk of a very dangerous bacterial infection which is known as clostridioides difficile it is one of the most dangerous forms of uh diarrhea clostridium uh, clostridioides difficile diarrhea that can also be associated with proton pump inhibitors unfortunately what we do is we always study the mechanism of action but when it comes to side effect we simply study 1 2 3 4 lot of points as as it is given in the books but we don't try to understand the reason behind it once you understand the reason behind why things occur then pharmacology is very easy some people have asked me this question also how to remember the dose of a drug now see this is a very very tough question to answer because suddenly if you ask me the dose of a medicine i can tell you very easily that i don't know i am very sorry my brother or sister i don't know i have to maybe <laughs> refer some book or maybe some app or something and i have to tell you see basically if you want to remember the dose of a drug i think already you are doing that number 1 through your hospital duty or clinical practice because when you are repeatedly seeing such kind of patients like for example you are posted in the cardiology department you are repeatedly seeing patients with myocardial infarction hypertension heart failure whatever it is so you are rep repeatedly seeing the medications that are being used in those patients so obviously when you write in the prescription you will get a habit because you will easily remember the dose of the drug as far as dosage adjustment is concerned that is not so easy because there are lot of drugs which require dosage adjustment in hepatic impairment or renal impairment so in that condition it is for a, you need to encounter such kind of cases otherwise it is not easy because simply if you read an app or you read a book in they will write a lot of things so it is it will be like a mechanical kind of thing so i believe that through your clinical practice you can remember the doses of drugs easily another method of remembering the dose of a drug is but that is not uh, completely effective but it is partially effective that is you can study the dose dependent effect dose dependent effect like for example if you know very well aspirin has anti inflammatory effect at a particular dose and it has anti platelet activity at another dose so like that also you can remember the dose that is called dose dependent effect like for example there is a medicine known as risperidone risperidone i hope you know very well it is a second generation antipsychotic 
mainly used in the treatment of schizophrenia so if you are giving the dose of risperidone above 6 mg per day once again if you are giving the dose of risperidone at above 6 mg per day it can increase the risk of extra pyramidal symptoms extra pyramidal symptoms means what risperidone they block dopamine type 2 receptor so as a result of which dopamine gets reduced and when dopamine gets reduced that is what you get extra pyramidal symptoms so below 6 mg per day it is okay but if you are giving daily dose i am talking about above 6 mg or 6 mg and above it causes this problem there is another medicine known as metoprolol for this you can actually refer the book uh, pharmacotherapy principles and practice by joseph t dipiro it's a very very good book for studying about diseases if you don't have the pdf you can message me i'll send you the pdf in that book when i was studying about hypertension in that it is written metoprolol you know very well it is a beta blocker hmm? and beta blocker it's not just a beta blocker it is a cardio selective beta blocker cardio selective means what cardio selective means it blocks beta type 1 receptor we have three beta receptors in our body beta 1 beta 2 beta 3 metoprolol bisoprolol they block beta 1 receptor so that is actually good for patients with asthma and copd because asthma and copd is actually associated with beta 2 receptors so if you are using a beta 1 blocker it is okay but if you are giving the dose of metoprolol above 50 mg per day above 50 mg per day or 50 or above 50 mg per day it loses its cardio selectivity and it becomes non-selective that means it will start blocking beta 2 and beta 3 as well so in this way also you can remember some amazing aspects of drug dosing otherwise there is no specific method to remember dose like for example if when you are studying also in your college times uh, our teachers normally tell us that whenever you write about medicines you should write dose but it is not so easy to you know write the dose because even if you write the dose of a particular medicine as 50 milligram in when it comes to hepatic dysfunction the dose will change when it comes to renal dysfunction the dose will change and it's not just hepatic and renal dysfunction you have to look at different stages of the gfr on the basis of that also the doses change so it's not easy to remember otherwise so basically through your clinical practice repeatedly if you are encountering such kind of cases or you can remember through this dose dependent kind of things then one question that you usually people ask me is that how to connect and study you know like if you look at my posts um, like uh, I think there is a reel of mine the first reel that I uploaded I never thought that it will become so viral uh, it's like 9 lakh 90 thousand people have played it in that I talked about proton pump inhibitors and association with and a risk of uh, worsening of osteoporosis in menopause females because as I said in that video estrogen and calcium are best friends so in menopause estrogen gets reduced so automatically calcium also gets reduced so if you are using proton pump inhibitor for a long time proton pump inhibitor also reduce the calcium level much more so you can you know understand what will happen with those kind of patients so basically if you want to uh, correlate things like this or connect the dots like this you should first understand the physiology of the body anatomy you know very well but physiology is important unless and until you understand what is the function of a particular receptor or a particular tissue or a particular organ you will never be able to understand what will be the effect of a particular medicine when it acts beneficially on that organ or when it acts harmfully on that organ so basically you need to understand the physiology first so whenever i study i first target the physiology after that when i go to pharmacology i can connect the dots because unless i don't unless i know the effect of estrogen on the body how will i say that proton pump inhibitor can increase the risk of osteoporosis in menopause females i cannot say that another question that people ask me that for example i said that proton pump inhibitors increase the risk of uh, osteoporosis in menopause females 
so then the next question that i saw in the comment section and many people asked me also that so what should we do should we stop the medicine i never asked you to stop the medicine so for this you need to understand a medical term which is known as risk versus benefit ratio risk versus benefit ratio what do you mean by that let me give you an example if you are suffering from epilepsy or if you encounter a patient suffering from epilepsy you know very well we give lot of medicines for seizures we have valproic acid we have phenytoin we have fosfenytoin we have carbamazepine uh, we have oxcarbazepine we have lacosamide blah blah whatever it is but if none of the medications are working then one of the last resort or one of the last medications that we go for is felbamate Uh, you may have heard about it felbamate and why is it the last choice because felbamate has a problem it causes aplastic anemia which is a very dangerous form of anemia aplastic anemia means your body is unable to produce blood cells and it also causes very very severe hepatotoxicity and that is why it is the last choice So, for example, if I tell you that felbamate causes hepatotoxicity and felbamate causes aplastic anemia, but if you see a patient who is not responding to any anti-epileptic medication, there is no other option. You may have to use it. So, basically, whenever you decide the choice of a medicine, we always look at the risk versus benefit ratio. If you have a better alternative, then you can go for that alternative. If you don't have a better alternative, then just manage the side effects that may happen you can prevent it by some supportive measures and you can carry on with that medicine otherwise every medicine has so many side effects every day we get new new informations about in fact recently i just saw uh, in a notice that ceftriaxone can prolong qt interval in fact ceftriaxone is such a commonly used medicine and it can prolong the qt interval so every medicine has so many effects it doesn't mean that you can stop all medicines together at the same time the patient will die so this is something that uh, i wanted to tell you and yesterday one person asked me a very interesting question uh uh what is the difference between side effect and adverse drug reaction you know some people get confused between this Uh, is side effect and adverse drug or adverse effect the same thing see basically side effect and adverse effect if you look at the word itself you will understand the difference adverse means what something that is negative adverse means something that is negative so adverse effect means it only has negative effect in your body it cannot cause any positive effect or whatever negative effect it causes in your body it cannot be used for a positive reason like for example if a medicine is causing hypersensitivity reaction in your body will you use that property for the treatment of any condition will you use the property of a medicine to cause hypersensitivity in some patients no hypersensitivity is something that is dangerous we don't want it so that is an adverse effect now what do you mean by side effect side effect is also similar to adverse effect but it may have a positivity in it for example metformin metformin causes a side effect which is known as anorexia and this anorexia leads to weight loss now this weight loss is actually good for those females who are suffering from pcod and they have obesity as well so this is called side effect so we are using the negative effect of a medicine for some positive indication in that condition we can say that it is a side effect otherwise it is always an adverse effect so please don't get confused between the both whenever you look at uh, for example a medicine is causing hepatotoxicity you cannot say that it is a side effect it is an adverse effect why will you want your liver to get damaged would you want that indication to happen in some other patients no so adverse effects are always negative side effects are sometimes useful please remember this adverse effects are always negative side effects are sometimes useful and um, i have a youtube channel some people are still confused about it 
द नेम ऑफ माई यूट्यूब चैनल इज डी ओ सी डॉक डॉट विष्णु सो प्लीज मेक श्योर दैट यू सब्सक्राइब टू माई यूट्यूब चैनल इन दैट यूट्यूब चैनल ऑल्सो आई हैव आई हैव टॉक्ट अबाउट सम टॉपिक्स लाइक टूमोरो माई वीडियो इज गोइंग टू कम रिगार्डिंग एपिलेप्सी सम इंटरेस्टिंग एस्पेक्ट ऑफ एपिलेप्सी इन विच आई टॉक अबाउट द डिफरेंसिस बिटवीन एपिलेप्सी सीशर एंड कन्वर्शन मेनी पीपल कंफ्यूज ऑल ऑफ दिस टूगेदर सो आई हैव टॉक्ट अबाउट दैट Yeah, you can see some amazing, uh, interesting aspects of metformin, and lot of other videos are also there, so you can check it out. One more thing that I uh, want to uh, tell you: whenever you study about a medicine, whenever you study about a medicine, please focus on patient counseling as well. like for example uh, yesterday uh, some days before i was actually talking to one person okay and uh, i asked them uh, what is the side effect of phenytoin okay so that person told me that phenytoin causes gingival hyperplasia so i think you know what is gingival hyperplasia gingiva means it is related to the gums hyper means big plasia means growth so gingival hyperplasia is a condition in which in between your teeth gums will start growing basically your gums are usually hard in nature but when gums start to grow in between your teeth they are usually soft and tender so if this kind of patients are using toothbrush which is of hard bristle like we have three kinds of toothbrushes we have soft bristle medium bristle and hard bristle right so for example some people have this psychological tendency that if you brush your teeth like anything if you vigorously brush your teeth it will become white some other people have this kind of tendency that if you are using a hard bristle toothbrush then only your teeth will be white some other people have this kind of tendency that if you are brushing your teeth for a very long duration then your teeth will be bright all of these are wrong you just need to brush your teeth in the correct way that's all so if you are a person who is using hard bristle toothbrush hard bristle toothbrush and if this gums are growing in between your teeth so what will happen as i said they are usually very tender the chances of them getting ruptured and then you start having gum bleeding and all this kind of problems so one advice that we can give to this patient is not just to maintain your oral or dental hygiene but also to use medium or soft bristle toothbrush especially if you are using that medicine for a long term so this is something that i derived from a scientific theory and it's something about it's just like a common sense kind of thing but when i talked to that person who told me about gingival hyperplasia what did that person say i'll tell you sir uh, phenytoin causes gingival hyperplasia so should we should advise the patient that it will cause gingival hyperplasia and they should be aware now when you are talking to a patient and if you say gingival hyperplasia how do you expect the patient to understand is the patient scientific like us is the patient from a medical background like us no so patient counseling means we have to talk in their language so we have to tell them that this medicine can cause some problem with your gums so please make sure that you don't brush your teeth very hard and if you are brushing your teeth please use soft or medium bristle toothbrushes so and uh, there are other forms of uh, counseling also like should you take the medicine before food should you take it after food and at what time of the day should you take for example there is a medicine known as clozapine clozapine is one of the most dangerous medicines in the treatment of schizophrenia if you are having schizophrenia with severe aggressive and suicidal tendency clozapine is the best choice because it blocks dopamine type 4 receptor so uh, clozapine has a problem because of its anticholinergic side effects it causes sedation so just imagine if you are taking that medicine in day time and you are working outside or maybe you are a person who works in the industry or who deals with dangerous chemicals or if you are a physician itself and if you are taking this medicine at day time just imagine what will happen you will get sedated and this can increase the risk of accidents so basically clozapine the best advice that we can give to the patient is as much as possible please take it at night time because of its problem of sedation so patient counseling is also something that we should focus on it's not just about giving a medicine to a patient 
you should also make the patient aware about the proper way of taking the medicine so that the treatment is rational that means the efficacy is more and the risk is less in fact uh, i would actually like to talk to you a bit more about all these things but uh, uh, this is the first time that i am actually uh, coming live and uh, i will be definitely you know coming live in future videos as well i know that a um, lot of things that i have said right now you may have some doubts or you may need some clarification so please make sure that you whatsapp me uh, please make sure that uh, you can inbox me also so i will uh, definitely respond back to you many of you i hope that i have i do have lot of things of my own i do a lot of study works and also sometimes i don't respond on time but i'll definitely try to respond you back there is no specific textbook like somebody has asked me this question uh, there is actually no specific textbook for patient counseling like if you look at any book also there is nothing like that there is no specific textbook basically if you want to uh, learn patient counseling or for example for hypertension we advise that you should increase your intake of potassium and magnesium rich foods because they are actually good for uh, reducing your blood pressure so basically if you are referring any website you you have lot of websites online we have healthline.com we have mayo clinic uh, we have top10homeremedies.com we have lot of websites but please look at their authenticity so how what do you mean by authenticity for example if they are mentioning a particular remedy if they are able to explain the reason behind it randomly if i tell you that you are hypertensive please increase your intake of potassium it is wrong i should have a scientific reason behind it if i have a scientific reason behind it and if there is some article or if there is some literature that also supports it then definitely that can be a very reliable uh, material for patient counseling you can check healthline.com mayo clinic some other websites are also there i'll come with a youtube video on that i'll come with a youtube video on that and in fact uh, i also have uh, some other amazing ideas for you i'm planning to uh, maybe conduct some zoom classes or uh, something related to that maybe i'll come on insta live and other than that some zoom classes i'm planning to conduct on specific aspects of pharmacology therapeutics patient counseling and toxicology specific topics i'm planning to so i'll be making my notes and i'll be converting them into powerpoints and i'll be presenting before you i definitely have such ideas let's see it is all based on your support because uh, your support is literally unbelievable means in the past 30 odd days we have around 66000 followers which is and that too with just 33 posts this is unbelievable Uh, and my youtube channel has also seen a massive growth so it's all because of you it's all because of your support so thanks a lot for that so i will definitely come with uh, more zoom videos zoom lectures uh, because in zoom they we have an option of recording as well so you can get access to the recording also we'll make some plans on that i'll make some ideas on that and uh, if you want pdfs of pharmacology or therapeutics and uh, toxicology and all these things then please just drop me a message in my whatsapp or uh, my instagram inbox if you are uh, messaging me i'm not sure whether we can send pdfs please drop me a message in whatsapp so i'll be happy to share it with you because maybe some of you don't know about lipincott's pharmacology reviews and i believe that it will literally be a loss if you don't know about lipincott's pharmacology reviews so i'll be happy to share it and um, definitely i'll be conducting more more uh, lectures on pharmacology therapeutics as i said and if you have i have actually noted all of your questions so please don't feel bad that i couldn't address yours because this instagram live i was thinking to make it 30 minutes it's already gone way beyond that so i have noted down your questions and i will be coming with individual videos on each of them so just give me some time because i never thought that this will be viral so just give me some time i'll be working on that and i'll do it accordingly
ओके माई मिशन इज वेरी सिंपल इट इज टू मेक कॉम्प्लिकेटेड थिंग्स सिंपल इन द मोस्ट सिंपलेस्ट मैनर एंड I also have plans to maybe in future write a book on pharmacology in the exact way that I share in my videos and my posts. Like for everything, I will be saying the reason behind it. So let it be a small book or let it be a big book; it doesn't matter. But I am planning for that as well. Let's see. It's all depending on future. So once again, thank you so much for investing your. priceless time with me i am literally seeing lot of uh, lots and lots and lots and lots of uh, reviews and things you have literally made me humble i can't imagine i am in mean, instagram live youtube and all this thing i never never knew how to use instagram and today i am in this position it's all because of you so thank you so much for that i'll definitely come next week with some amazing interesting ideas which i will be sharing on instagram live and please do support me because i have great ideas for you ahead i'll be sharing my notes and i'll be taking zoom classes for you in future as well maybe on weekends or something because weekends you will be free even i will be free hopefully so weekends is something that i will prefer targeting okay so please uh, it's my humble request uh, please do follow my instagram channel and do subscribe to my youtube channel which is on the same name the link is in the bio itself so that's it for now thank you so much i hope you have a great career and learning time ahead